morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Saturday sessions of the Ideas Festival. My name's George O'Farrell, and I'm the facilitator for the session this morning. Uh, down and dirty is peak soil more pressing than peak oil. Um, one housekeeping matter, we are going to do this session in two parts, so Deb will talk for uh, about 15 minutes and then we'll have about five minutes of questions and then she'll talk again for a little longer and then we'll have some more questions. This session is being vodcast, whatever that is, um, but I believe that's being filmed. Uh, so if you do want to ask questions, could you please wait until someone arrives with a, uh, a microphone so that we can capture it all for the recording? That would be very helpful. Um, just by way of introduction, I would mention one of life's coincidences, really, that when you agree to do something, other things happen in your life that draws attention to it. And having agreed to facilitate this session, I was walking past a TV last weekend and I saw a program called One Plus One, or the beginning of it. And they were talking to a guy called Lester Brown from the World Watch Institute about pressures on world food. And as, as I went past, I heard him cite three demand pressures, which I thought I might just mention quickly. Um, the first one was population growth of 80 million people a year, which means in his terms that Every day there are 219,000 new people at the dinner table who weren't there last night. Increasing affluence is the second one, so there are about 3 billion people, according to Lester Brown, who want to move up the food chain, consuming what he called grain-intensive lifestyle products. Now, I'm buggered if I know what a lifestyle product is, but I gather it's actually food, um, um, meat, eggs and milk. Um, and the other issue he identified was that um, more and more grain production in the US is being turned into fuel for cars, so it was something like just over 30% last year. Anyway, it's not for me to talk about these things, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you Deb Newell. Um, Deb has a paramedic degree, having started her career as a physiotherapist, um, and subsequently discovered great passion in food in the food industry where she's been a caterer, a presenter, a restaurant chef, a food technician, a cookery teacher and event designer and God knows what else. Um, between 1997 and 2001, um, uh, Deb developed a beef flavour assessment program called the Paddocks to Pallets uh, and her experience in that program highlighted to her the landscape and biodiversity devastation caused Sorry? No, I just, I just had a request for a higher volume. Ah, right, <laughs> sorry. Um, so Deb then formed the Hunter Gatherer Dinner Club in 2009, which is a targeted appeal for a return to our original human diet, that of the Hunter Gatherer. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Deb Newell. Uh, my apologies for interrupting my own address, um, but I've had a couple of queries with people saying they can't hear. Are there, the volume can't go up anymore, is this right? You can hear now? Is, yes, all right. Okay, welcome to peak soil, or well, there's no welcome to peak soil. It's, um, it's pretty scary, I think. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide this this address into two sections. I'm going to talk soil, I'm going to talk dirty first, um, which is going to be not fun, sadly. Um, and then I'm going to stop for a short bit of questions. Remember, I am not a soil scientist. This is a new journey for me. Um, uh, I'm just learning about this, and I'm taking you on a journey that I've been following now for a couple of years. Then I'll have some questions after this, and then I'll get into a subject that I, I feel very comfortable with, and I know quite a bit about, and that's the subject of food and what should be the human diet. So could everyone please just have a look on the screens, wherever they are, and have a look at that absolutely beautiful watercolour done by Albert Dürer some 500 years ago. Now, when you look at that, there's about seven different um, pasture species in that um, watercolour. They've been identified. Some are 
uh, have been, were used as uh, pharmaceutical, medicinal um, uh, plants. Some are fodder, some we can eat. But what I need you to see is this is biodiverse. They're all competing against each other. They're all healthy. And he's even gone down to show us the roots underneath that. Now, that's one of the key things about soil. The soil underneath those plants relies upon the biodiversity on top of it. So there are some very beautiful thoughts that I've found on soil, and we'll now go to this. I shall read this, but you may also read it on the screen. So from Pliny the Elder, some, somewhere around 2327 AD, it is certain that a soil that has the taste of perfume will be best. If we need an explanation of the odour of such soil, it often occurs when the ground is not being turned up, just towards sunset, at the place where the ends of the rainbows have come down to earth and when the soil has been drenched after rain drought. The earth then sends that divine breath of hers, of quite incomparable sweetness, which she has conceived from the sun. Isn't that fabulous? And I think we've all, after a period of drought, known that there's a storm coming our way and we smell it before it comes. It's, that is that divine breath of, 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 um, of hers. Further, I now have one of my heroes I discovered some years ago is E.O. Wilson. He's been the professor of ecology at Harvard. He holds multiple uh, positions. I think he's now emeritus. He's the man who developed the words or the phrases biodiversity, which is now part of our lexicon, ecosystem, and another one he's done is coevolution. Um, he's uh, he, due to a, an eye injury, his science became on the wee things in life. And I have my daughter here today because many years ago, when she was trying to get the job of um, house captain in her primary school, she did a speech based on the importance of being small. Now, she was very small. So I looked up all these things, and I'd read a Suzuki book, and in the Suzuki book, um, I'd come across some amazing statistics from E.O. Wilson. And these are, in a pinch of garden soil, about a gram in weight, live millions of bacteria representing several thousand species. And then I'm going to read the big one from here. The Earth is... The only planet we know that has a biosphere, this thin, membranous layer of life is our only home. It alone is able to maintain the exact environment we ourselves need to stay. And on your screens, he, I continue, or he continues, most of the organisms of the biosphere and the vast number of its species can be found at the surface or just below it. Through their bodies pass the cycles of chemical reactions upon which all life depends. With precision exceeding anything our technology can match, some of the species break down the dead plant and animal material falling from above. Specialised predators and parrots feed on these scavengers and higher level specialists feed on them in turn. The whole working together in a constant turnover of birth and death returns the plants, to the plants the nutrients needed to continue photosynthesis. Without the smooth working of all this linkage, the biosphere would cease to exist. He goes on to say that we had something that we have been a long time coming to understand, and the word is our whole ground habitat, our soil is alive. People have now compared it to, okay, what's, you know, there's a, the trick question, hopefully only in primary school, as to what is the human body's largest organ? You know, and if it's ABC, they'll have things like, you know, liver, lungs, heart. But the answer is our skin. It's our largest living organism. And what E.O. Wilson is now saying is the soils, the Earth's soil is actually the largest living organism we have. Um, there are some, another, another book which is one of those seminal books, and if you've ever read it or, you, or if you can order it, do so. It was published in 1997. It's by an amazing Australian woman called Mary White. It was called Listen, Our Land is Crying. And she was the first person to produce this beautiful book to bring us 
to the awareness of things like salinity. She then, in this, has put down an inventory, which is very, I think, rather fun, of one hectare of arable US soil, there you have 1,000 kilograms of worms, 1,000 kilograms of arthropods, 150 kilograms of algae, 1,700 kilograms of bacteria, 2,700 kilograms of fungi. She hasn't added to that seeds, decaying plant material, decay, decaying animal material. So you, you're starting to get this thing we call dirt is so much, so much more than that. Just for a, um, just to add, we're meant to be having a bit of humour in all of this. Um, do we realise that four out of every five um, animals on our planet is a nematode? Puts us into our perspective. And in fact, we're meant to be, we should have some of our own. We, we're now working out that we actually should carry worms. We get less allergic if we do. And we have now identified 700 bacteria in our mouths. So there you go. No wonder we sometimes get bad breath. So um, uh, moving on. So basically, the importance of small things is the biomass. This is another E.O. Wilson. The biomass of all things that we can't see is greater than the biomass of all things we can see. And we're talking rainforests, elephants, whales, you know, insects, or whatever. Further, that the biomass of all, li all life from the soil surface down is greater than the, all, than the biomass of all things above. So these are pretty big numbers. So the conclusion is obviously that this planet is run by we things. They really are more important than us. Wilson once said that if, if we were to disappear from the face of the earth, the fish would return to the ocean, the grazing animals to the pastures, the, the trees to the forest, etc., etc. You know, but if ants were to disappear, and they were his original speciality, life as we know it would cease to exist. So, um, so the whole idea here is that soil matter really matters. Now, talking about soils, I thought, well, let's find out about soils. What are soils? And there's um, an organisation now in the, in the ne Netherlands called the International um, Soil Research and Information Centre. And I just the amount of soils that they list and register in this area is phenomenal. You can then go to the USDA site, and the USDA site, um, United States Development of, uh, Department of Agriculture site, and they list um, 12 soils. And I've listed these. They, ob they um, obviously, uh, vary with, you know, humus. The key thing is water and solar energy. So you have got soils that have recently been deposited, like the mud from the, Bris from the Brisbane floods or from sand or whatever, but they all have varying fertilities or non lack, lack of fertilities. In Australia, we have named 14 soils, but quite seriously, I think we can just go with sandy, loamy, black, red, Acidic, alkali, saline, well, which is alkali, or sodic. Now, I'm about to go into a few um, uh, photographs or images, which are courtesy of National Geographic, and I did phone them, and they said I was allowed to use them. So the first one here is a map of the fertile soil of the world. Now the dark green bits are the really fertile soil. The lighter green bits are sort of what you'd call good soil and productive soil. And the ochre coloured bits are marginal soils. Now uh, here's 
this is sort of becoming a marginal soil. So this was cropping land. As you can see, it looks like it's got um, a cultivated crop because the herbage is all about the same height. There are a couple of trees in the distance. What you've got here is a, a clay-based soil that is cracking. Cracking soils, of course, uh, trees don't like cracking soils, which is why our Darling Downs never had a lot of trees, because it's those black soils of ours crack. Um, you've got here, as you can see, a lot of salt deposits. Some, so let's go down to a few stats. Now, I've headed this um, slide. I've taken the quote from President Roosevelt. He made this observation after visiting the um, Dust Bowl. Now, if you want to know about the economy of soil, the Dust Bowl was one of the large contributors to the Great Depression. That was when basically all the, the uh, croplands it, um, just lost their soil, it blew away. Uh, Steinbeck wrote a book called The Grapes of Wrath based on, on the poverty this caused. But Wolf, uh, Roosevelt said, um, a nation that destroys its soils destroys itself. We are now a globe that is destroying our soils and we will destroy ourselves itself. Um, some global stats. 3% of the Earth's surface is fertile soil, and think back of the, um, the, the slide I just showed you, or 10% of the non-ice-covered terrestrial surface. We lose between 10 million, uh, that was a quote from Mary White, hectares of fertile soil per annum, um, and the USDA are now saying we're now losing 7.5 million. I think we have woken up, hopefully not too late, to some of the realities of soil um, conservation and soil security. In 1991, the ISRIC, that's the International Soil Research and Information Centre, estimated that we had degraded more than 7.5 million square miles of land. That is the area of US and Canada combined. Now, it takes approximately 10 uh, 100 years to build 10 centimetres of humus-rich soil. Vegetables need at least 30 centimetres, grasses up to three metres. A lot of the perennials of both the American prairie and Australia, we have a fabulous in Queensland in the Brigalow region, one of the iconic uh, plants of the Brigalow region is Dicanthium sericeum, which is a uh, grass I studied, um, and it can sink its roots three metres. So that's why our grasses, after we get rain, come back, because they've gone to live in their roots and they just wait for the good times to turn up. So, but other just normal turf grasses, up to three metres, uh, you know, they will need about a metre. And trees, of course, generally need up to, you know, big, big trees need more than three metres. So if we take 100 years to build 10 centimetres of soil, we obviously can't replace this stuff. This is endangered and, in fact, um, it, you know, it is a disappearing essential resource. So now let's have a look. Oh, at, if we now focus at that 3% of the Earth's surface that is fertile, 70% of this is now in service to agriculture, primarily for human food. The fertile land area underneath our cities and built up areas is approximately the land surface area of the People's Republic of China. Now when you cover, I mean we are all standing here today on soil. We're standing here today or sitting here today on alluvial soils. Our buildings compact soils, they turn them anaerobic, there is no gaseous exchange and we probably have killed whatever used to be alive underneath there. Especially the greater the, greater the area of soil covered, the worse the effect. Um, just over 20% and falling is covered by relatively intact forest and conservancy zones. That's 0.6% of land of total um, terrestrial service. And I don't have any figures, sorry, for... Um, uh, mining, the mining areas. Now please, if everyone could just have a quick look at this um, image. 
this is um, a plough at work. This is, uh, will be for cereal cropping. It may be for cotton, but I would suggest. This is in the uh, American prairie. As you look at this, you'll see how vulnerable the soils. There is already a wind. If there's a bigger wind, that topsoil will be lost. And Iowa has lost in the last 40 years 50% of its fertile um, topsoil. Obviously, this is going to be a monoculture. And remember back to Dura, nature hates a monoculture. It likes biodiversity. Next image. This is the Loess Plateau in China, massive area again. The Loess Plateau, this is, a, this is soil that is silt. Um, the Chinese now have realized that they lose huge amounts through erosion, and this is the effort of planting trees to hold back the silt. The problem is if they have a drought, the trees they plant don't survive, and so you know, the effort to recover soil is huge. Now let's go over to what used to be the Fertile Crescent. This is a, an ex-town in Syria. This was not cereal cropping or rice growing. This devastation was caused by olive trees. So what I'm trying to say is soil is the real world bank. Without fertile soil, our economies will clash. Without fertile soil, there will be no us. Intensive. And when we talk agriculture, and everyone does this all the time, we, we, in Australia, I've grown up, I have uh, worked a lot in the um, agricultural industry, and we always pride ourselves on how efficient we are at producing our foods in Australia, mainly because we do intensive and extensive farming. We are very, very um, slighting of Europe. But I tell you, in Europe, we have little tiny soil patches that are fertile, uh, that have fertile boundaries around them. Those small farms actually, by having changing their crops, save their soils. But the basic things, we are now losing our fertile soil faster than we can replace it. So everyone, we are now in that new era, and that era is called the, era, the epoch of peak soil. Now, I just refer very quickly because I said, is peak oil very more scary or than peak soil? And I say it isn't. We can all remember back to our grandparents or our great-grandparents' day when we, went, we moved by horsepower. We walked to where we worked. That was only not even a blink of an eye again. At the end of the day, we can actually go back to living without oil. But we can't go back to living without soil. There is no substitute for food. Now, I'll just stop there, and if there are any, just a few questions, um, I would like to, uh, you know, we'll make these short, because I think I might have spoken over time. And there is a, um, a roving mic. Thanks. Um, is this on? Yeah. Um, so you haven't really talked about what can be done. You've talked about all the bad things that civilization has done to soil. I don't know if you're going to go into it in the second part of your lecture, but there are examples of people in the Brazilian Amazon who actually built soils by living on it. Will you discuss those, or can you now? Yes, I can. You're talking about the Terra, Pet the terra Petra soils. Um, if, you, um, if I were clever enough to be able to go back quickly to my very first map of, is this one coming through? This one. Um, if you can see, there are little red dots on that. In uh, South America, those are terra petra sites. So what, uh, storing carbon in soil and all of this, these were sort of like um, compost heaps. Um, what did we used to do when we, you know, you, you, we had incinerators? This is where food waste, um, animal waste, everything was put into these pits that was burnt and then this became, this is dense, dense, uh, highly fertile soil. Putting, putting life and humus back into soil is a major issue. Um, I am now about to talk on a different level for one thing I think we can do, and that's basically um, see which soils we can rest to let nature also return um, 
life to soils. And, and there was another question, I think, over here. Is that on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Deb, just wondering if you've also looked at um, peak nitrogen. Ah, uh, I wanted... 96% um, of the atmosphere is nitrogen. Our skins are very much nitrogen. Um, I am coming on to that, and it's one of my... Please remind me, put your hand up and wave uh, when I talk food production, okay? Okay. One more, and then we've got to move on. Deb, I, um, whilst we're on that image, you can see in the middle of Africa a dark green dot surrounded by grey. I wonder yeah. why that area is so productive. Do you know well, Most of that? the dark green bits, again, have rainforest or deep forest because the soil depth is that, you know. Once again, solar energy plus moisture makes it Now, we may just, I've just been um, asked to move on. So we're going to go into section two when I get back to it. There was one other question at the back while I'm doing this. Can I answer that quickly? Okay. Okay. So, just a second. So what's this thing called food? So now I get back into my area and that's food. One of the... the, the we all sit here, we're sitting here. What was that Newton said? If I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. We're sitting here in a library, which is an area of learning, of held learning, because about 10,000 years ago, we hit on this amazing idea of instead of following our animals around, we could grow grain, and therefore we could settle, we could develop cities. We didn't have to work so hard for our food. This was called the agrarian revolution, and we probably celebrated as the greatest, greatest invention or development humans have ever, ever developed. Okay. We then added the, the might of the Industrial Revolution, and then we added the chemicals of the Green Revolution. We started noticing that our fertile so soil crescent, uh, the soils in the fertile crescent were getting poorer, but we kept moving. We now have had a second green um, revolution and we are now in a biotech revolution. But I'm going to sit here and say that it's about time we got off the, off the shoulders of what I call the newest of human foods and that's cereals, grains. They were never part of our diet. I do run a business called the Hunter Gatherer Dinner Club and the Hunter Gatherer foods were our original foods. They were the foods we co-evolved with and I'd have to say you wouldn't be doing well if I said to you all, go out into the grassland. I want you to go and pick a whole swathe of um, grasses. I want you to bring those back. I want you then to thresh them. I then want you to winnow them. I then want you to sieve them. I then want you to grind them. Now, having done all that, and you might have a handful of, um, of a flour in, your, in the cup of your hand, you and I are going to need some water to mix with that so that we can eat it. The problem about food is food is energy. You have just done more work than you will have got from eating that grain. So that's why it wasn't big. It was there a bit. Indigenous Australians used it. There's a grass called Queenslandicum panicum, which is a native millet. But it was more like an adhesive, a glue, a coating to stop things drying out. It was not a main food. So. In many ways, from now on in, I haven't titled this, but it is really uh, going to be a subject of my book, and that's going to be called Going Against the Grain. When we grow grains, they rob from the soil. They don't return to the soil. They will take the nitrogen, the carbon, whatever, but nothing goes back. For years, we, didn't, we now say, let's leave litter. We now direct till. Every time you till soil, you bring oxygen into stored carbon and you create carbon dioxide. So what we have is this whole diet. I mean, I, my mother is in the audience tonight. I was told when I was a child that if I ate too much pasta, I'd get fat. The world eats too much pasta. The world is now fat. We all call it the Mediterranean foods, but pasta only came from some areas of Italy. 
It was not a main thing. If you lived in Rome, you lived on offal if you were rich enough. It was the prized meat. We have uh, Spain. We have Greece. There are lots of Mediterranean foods that did not depend on, on grain. But grain does not give back. Now we have the, the, this increasing loss of fertility under the main granaries of the world. To get over that, we add nitrogen. Now, there's one major issue with ad adding nitrogen to soil, and we've just found it because we're just starting to look at our soils and what lives there. Too much nitrogen, even from if you've got a leguminous crop, monoculture, too much nitrogen does something that nobody had really thought about and was only discovered 20 years ago. In the top 30 centimetres of soil on the planet live a thing that we've just discovered called methanotrophic bacteria. And, I, and I, I was so pleased when I found this because, you see, we've always had ruminants. Everyone's against grazing animals. Grazing animals were part of life on Earth. Grasses want to be grazed because they're stuck in the ground. They need their seed to be transported. A grazing animal does that for them. They developed um, burrs, so the rabbit or the whatever, when, when it went past, picked seed and transported it. So we've got this whole cycle of grazing animals that eat, manage grasslands, and their waste goes back to the soils underneath them. We then did something very wrong to these grazing animals. We developed land tenure. And we put fences because they were meant to follow the green. They all move. So when we stopped them in their tracks, we created another problem, and that was called overgrazing. And we destroyed our soils because we trapped our animals. The prairie was one of the most amazingly rich vertebrate biodiverse zones in the world. It had bison. It had mammoths. It had even camels. It had horses. It had large antelopes. It is now a cornfield. And, that corn, and when, it when it was first became a cornfield, that soil underneath it was incredibly fertile because of what it had been. Now it's losing its fertility, drastically. So I then turn around and say, everywhere I research this panic about food um, is this, how can we grow more cereals? And that is my big idea, is let's say we don't need these cereals, or not as much. Let's bring down the cereals in our diet, and if we do that, can we save some of these grasslands? Because it's the rangelands and the grasslands that cereal agriculture headed to. You know why? The soil was fertile, but there were no lumps and bumps and hills and gullies. It was easier. We tended to leave the grazing animals to do the hillier stuff. So I now come into the concept of, of food, food choices, and what we call staples. So I'm just going to ask everyone, please put up your hand and tell me what you consider a food staple. I've scared you, haven't I? Rice and bread. Okay, rice and bread. Okay. Okay, there's been fabulous anthropological, physiological studies done. In China, um, from 5,000 before present to 8,000 before present, in northern districts of, of Longshan and Yangshao, they um, research, research the, skeletal, the skeletal remains. That's all we can. Similarly, this was done in um, the North American plains and uh, river um, and the river valleys and in the Iberian Peninsula. When grain came into the diet, and I've researched this with Professor Neil Mann, who's uh, Professor of Nutrition at, uh, at RMIT and now visiting fellow over in Oxford. When we started eating grain, our community health collapsed. We went from being very tall people to women especially becoming shorter. We developed dental caries, osteoporosis, and osteopenia, which is brittle bones. 
We also have now developed the concept and we are recognising that we have leaky guts. There is a uh, professor called Alessio Fasano who's over at Stanford University. And we, leaky gut, as he said, our stomachs, remember, we still have hunter-gatherer stomachs. That's what we are physiologically. Our stomachs did not expect the proteins of some grains. Noticeably, we know about gluten, but there are different proteins in barley and oats, etc. Obviously not some, which are like um, rice. But this, this is foreign. These proteins are foreign to the villi in our stomach, and it breaks down their, permeab their impermeability. And he now lays at, this, at the door of this a, a raft of diseases. We obviously have gluten intolerance. At the high end of that, we have celiac disease. But most people do, and different cultures. I mean, if you're Irish, you're more likely to have um, a celiac problem or a gluten intolerance problem. Once again, this will be because of when grains came to your diets, into your diet. So basically what I'm saying here is I actually feel like the little boy in the, em in the emperor's clothing. I'm saying, no, this is not a staple food. It's a poor food for the effort required to produce it. The greatest mantra that you can ever have with environment, environmental management is to think these words. What am I doing? And am I doing it to the greatest and highest purpose? So it would be my contention that the grasslands of the world have a higher purpose than growing grains. Grains that are not particularly good for us, but grains that sadly have now become part of a global business model. World agriculture and the major corporations that depend on, on it adore an annual crop. So we have everybody from, from the seed owners and the germplasm owners to the fertilizing companies because you see as these soils get poorer we add nitrogen Nitrogen kills methanotrophic bacteria. So while we add nitrogen, we increase methane into the atmosphere. We now have peak phosphate, and that's hit um, even the business pages. So we have fertilizer companies. We need oil. We need oil to get, we use oil to get fertilizers, right? So even peak oil is going to affect this equation. And then we go into the, I've just lost my thread, we've gone from oil, peak soil. So we actually have to keep saying when we look at food, is this food worth it? Is the food we're eating worth its dirt? And if I can leave you with one thought, I would like you to do that. Every time you eat something, is it worth, is this worth the dirt it has? And when we look at that, we also then have to bring in an another major problem we have, and that is waste. Uh, uh, there's been recent research, Julian Cribb, who's written a book called The Coming Famine. He says that for every 4,000 4, kilograms of grain planted, less than 2,000 reach our food tables. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? The problem with planting cereals and even with other horticultural food crops is they're rooted to the ground. So what we've just seen across the Darling Downs, even though these people now do direct till sowing of their seeds, and even though they leave their litter on the ground, that didn't matter to the floodwaters. But wherever grasses and trees were in place, the soil stayed. So we have soil security at risk. Right? So we then move on to the soil life. We now know that we add fertilizers, and those fertilizers are sort of pretty ad hoc. We don't know what they're doing to the life underneath it. We only know about 10% of the life in those soils. So we have these soil life being killed, therefore we have less and less crops, our fertility rate drops. We then have other issues. We have locusts, we have rodents, and for all the vegetarians here, there's a lot of life killed by cereal agriculture. 
We kill the insects, we kill the rodents, we kill anything else that would like to be on that place and call this food. We then put it in trucks, we then store it in silos, and then we have big mildew problems. So we have to use fungicides, etc., to kill the mildew. Then we get it to our stores, into our cereal packets, and we buy it. We take it home, and we might throw out half the pasta dish. The cereal might have weevils, and someone might just say, because we're a rich country and we've got food abundance, nah, I don't like that, and throw it out. So that's another issue. And the food waste, of course, goes across all types of food. So we come back to what I keep saying should be our food, and that's hunter-gatherer choices. We don't have to have a lot of animal products in our diet. We do know that we're designed to eat animals. Our teeth are shaped to eat animals. Our stomach juices are sitting there waiting for animal product to come our way. We know we cannot make our own amino acids. If you're a vegetarian, you probably need to source your amino acids from seven different, five to seven different plant kingdom species, legumes, etc., and green plants and whatever. Each one of those will have required farming effort. Each one of those will have required fertile soil. Each one of those will have required chill management. Soya, by the way, was never a, na a human food because it's actually toxic to us raw. It actually has to, it requires some sort of steam heat treatment before we can eat it. So when you go shopping, what I would like you to do is to think of your soil, think of a new concept of maybe buying peak food. We've got peak soil. We're in the era or the epoch of peak soil, so we should make sure that every mouthful counts. What you eat, you need to eat. We don't need a lot, as much food as we eat, we know that. In fact, the saddest and worst what food waste of all is obesity. But if you think that, and if you think, as my friend Lindy Milan, who's a great food, he says, it's a really good thing. Go to your fruit, fruiterer, go to your butcher, go to your uh, uh, supermarket and ask yourself, could I have hunted this, could I have gathered this? It might be a cheese or milk or whatever, etc. But I'm coming back, think about that, but think about one other thing, we're thinking about the soil. So when your perspective starts at the soil and you think up from the soil, and you think to the greatest and highest use, when we grow wheat and take the grain to become a um, food source, we've used really good fertile soil for that. What else do we get out of that? Tell me. Is there anything we el else we get out of that product? Now, if any of you here have needed collagen, yes? Yes. Well, this, this gentleman's got an American accent, and this is one of my problems. The cattle. I blame America. I'm sorry. Oh, is it? Sorry. Okay. Well, that's one of my major things. No, I mean, not in Australia. Still, most of our cattle are, are free range. Cattle never, no, sh no animal ever, ev not now. Well, we'll talk about that later. I'd love to talk about that. There's only about 40% are finished in feedlots. 40% are finished in... I, I, I worked with Meat and Livestock Australia for a while, but basically, where, whatever it is, we developed... America developed in, um, intensive farming. In the 60s, they had a, crank, a, a corn glut. So they said, what are we going to do with all of this? And they said, we could feed it to the cattle. Then we came onto the thing. We feed the grain to the cattle, therefore we've got more more land to grow grain. These animals don't want to be locked up. It was not their idea. It's an end use of grain. We actually have a grain glut. We are not running out of grain. You've, have you seen that ad on TV about an insect repellent spray that comes in in cornstarch? I mean, we're desperately trying places to put corn syrup, cornstarch. You know, so that's the other issue, but it doesn't they're biofuels for other people, but that is the worst idea we've ever come up with. To grow food to feed cars. That's a bad idea. But the other thing is, if you now talk about...
think of the, the animals that we've been eating for the longest. So we're thinking of chickens and pigs and sheep and goats and cattle. So most of those, the goats, sheep and cattle are the big no-nos because they're ruminants, but we've always had ruminants. In fact, we've got less ruminants on the face of the earth now than we did years ago, uh, millions of years ago. But we wear their leather, we wear their fibre. We use their blood and bone as fertiliser. If you go and get on a, a, say, a, on a drip, if you're going to have a, a plasma drip, it's likely to have come from a bovine source. If you have children who haven't grown very tall, you may well be putting them on hormone growth to promotants. That will have come from a bovine source. Women who are trying to put off menopause will be using the farmed est you know, female hormones, the estrogens and progesterones from specifically horses in a, in a quite disgusting procedure, although in Australia there is a very good way of doing this. If you need an aorta, you will get it from a pig or a, or a bovine. Women, your collagen comes from bovine sources. We have tools made of bones. We even use the guts of these animals um, and their tendons and their, and their tendons for musical instruments. So what we have here for the soil investment in animals is a food, is a fibre, um, massive amounts of pharmaceutical goods, building goods. So I think at the end of the day, I'm the one person standing up for meat in the diet or animal products in the diet. It doesn't stop there. If you think soil, go back to the hunter-gatherer. That was our original diet. That's what we should eat. Redu I have bread, but I reduce it heavily because I know it's costing our Earth's earth, our mother soil. So good we named it twice. Okay, questions? Um, it's a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'll, I'll admit up front I'm probably biased because I am vegetarian, um, simply for, well, for many reasons, um, because I think vegetarianism promotes non-violence in the world, but I'll leave that aside. That's uh, something I, I, I noticed in your address which I don't agree with technically. Uh, you mentioned, okay, sure, you know, um, man-made fertilizers uh, containing nit uh, sorry, nitrogen probably, yes, do destroy methane atrophic bacteria. Um, but, however, have you given a thought to the fact that if we go back to a true kind of ecological economic base where we use a kind of a systems uh, type approach mimicking nature, that that's not even a problem anymore? Are you aware that we can take human waste, for example, yeah. we can treat it and we can grow nitrogen fixating bacteria and we, have, we can have complete control over that in terms of the types of bacteria we, we want to grow or facilitate for the different uh, uh, deteriorating soil types. And I have a friend uh, who had a small business in this area. He was even rejuvenating golf courses without harming the, the greens, etc. But he wanted to go to a bigger scale, you know, obviously to, to you know, close the loop with human waste and sewage treatment plants, but of course the government's not interested. But what I want to say to you is that I, I don't agree uh, that hunter-gathering hunter is the solution, no. Uh, I think we've evolved more, um, but vested interests are holding us back to the new paradigm shift. And are you prepared to look at that area of um, growing and, and using our wastes um, and advocating for this so that we are actually creating nitrogen fixating bacteria, different types of bacteria to help replenish and regenerate the soil? Okay. And I think it's a misnomer to uh, rely only on this, this idea of, you know, the corporate... Uh, uh, the corporate definition of sustainability. I totally disagree with it. Who wants to have a sustainable marriage? Let's look at regeneration. So what do you say to that? Look, I'm, the question I think you're, you're ma making a point that um, Julian Cribb makes in his book, that maybe we have to look at growing foods in things like old waste oils. You know, these are um, sludges, our own waste. Uh, we, we're going past a lot of that. By all means, um, we always actually have to f 
uh, we can do things on an individual basis. Uh, the, the biggest problem, of course, when you're talking about bacteria being a, appropriate to the foods above them, when we only know about 10% of the bacteria of the soils and we're just starting to map, you know, what plants need what, I, well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually taking this from fairly valid um, sources. Um, so I feel, and I also say that we have not evolved past being hunter-gatherers. We still have the same digestive juices. I mean, I will consider we have evolved when maybe I lose my little toe, which is a pain in the neck in some shoes at the moment. But we're not involved. Uh, Peter Singer says the same thing. We used to be hunter-gatherers. Physiologically, we are still hunter-gatherers. By anatomical and physiological processes, that's who we are. And that's what we are designed to be. That's why don't we don't um, have large stomachs. We require and we use animals to do some of our, our food processing for us, if you would have it. Is there another question? Um. Well, I'm going to confess an interest. I definitely like meat. Um, and I also like cereals, but I've got a leaky gut and I'm definitely convinced that they're part of the problem. But I, th I think your ideas are very stimulating and, I mean, they're out of left field in a way. They're not what we're used to hearing. I, they make me think of um, we're part of a big commune and one of the members there is extremely hostile to cloven hoof animals because he says they compact the soil and we're all hanging out for him to leave so that we can get a cow or two. <laughs> but I have certainly seen, like in all the outback areas of Western Australia, where there's all the station country and lots of um, sheep, cows and goats too, the destruction that they can wreck to the soil, to the scrub country when, when it's overstocked, I, I, I think is something we have to grapple with. Uh, with the, the numbers of animals we would require to feed the number of people that are alive. Can I throw it back? Okay, I, it's very interesting about how much meat we actually do need or uh, milk or cheese or butter or any animal byproducts. I mean, I suppose we've, I'm probably trying to say that we don't need a lot, but also um, this is, we've done um, the grasslands which are, tend to be um, more semi-arid zones, an enormous disservice by overstocking. Uh, and uh, we've cleared, we were told to clear, we all know that our poor producers, our pastoralists were told, were given grants and money if they cleared the land. We didn't know what we were doing. Um, with regard to looking at this sort of thing, and, I, and I'm going to also mention this, I'm, going, I'm going, getting back to the previous speaker as well, talking about this community approach. Um, and thinking methane, because that's one of the big things that everyone attacks now, that a lot of these animals emit methane. Um, if you look at it, the largest organi you know, species organisms, the largest body mass of species on the face of this planet are humans. There's more human flesh, human matter, than any other species. Um, I'm not saying the other species combined, but other individual species. Now, we know that ruminants, you know, we've, we talk about cloven hoofs. Mind you, of course, the cloven hoof splits, you know, and by splitting, you know, it's been designed. They're still being designed for grasslands. These animals were designed. A horse's hoof with its cup actually creates a vacuum when it walks. The cloven hoof spreads the weight. Uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that's just, that is just um, a, a, a physical characteristic. But if we get back into this large community, we're all sitting there. Um, I'm the one, the, the, the little boy is saying the emperor's not wearing any clothes. I'm saying the food we call staple shouldn't be. Um, and everyone now says, well, what about methane? Now, we are the next largest. We're this huge number of people now. We have methane in our mouths, hence we get bad breath. We also have it in our gut. Everybody knows that their flatulence goes up if they have a lot of beans. Maybe a bean curry is probably about the worst. 
Um, uh, and then we might be sitting around in this big, large global community room watching telly, and Rover's over there, and there's this odor goes past, and the dog's blamed, right? I think we, forget, we keep forgetting, well, what we're doing is it's not Rover lying there, we have higher methane, and we're pointing the finger at cattle, and maybe sheep, and all the cud chewers. When we ourselves, by sheer bulk of our volume, are also major methane producers, and um, if you have a diet that causes a lot of flatulence, you're really adding to the um, atmospheric problem. Just a thought. Over, over here, and then over here, and I think that may be about it. We've got about four minutes left. Have I, did, did I do nitrogen? Uh, I've seen the, the Food Inc. movie and read Omnivore's Voice to Dilemma of late and had a look at the, the Joel Salatin method yes. of, of cropping and stuff, and he was actually out here last year in, in December. Do you think that style of beef grazing can actually be, be scaled up, and what do you think of that particular concept? Oh, thank you very much. One of my um, supporters and, uh, for the hunter-gatherer dinner club was a gentleman called Tony Coote. He used to have a proper um, uh, jewellery business, which he sold, and he has a property outside Canberra called Maloon Creek Natural Farms, which are drop-down dead gorgeous. They're part of the Peter Andrews, um, uh, what is it, uh, natural sequence farming. You know, once again, uh, this is a system where we, we base farming on, on the way it is, where you let your creeks bog up or snag up so that the water goes sideways rather than straight through. Um, and jo jo Joel Salatin was out there speaking at his property. Um, if you go to this, and you know, this was, if you saw those um, Australian story things with Jerry Harvey, you will have seen, you know, here's a property and it's looking fantastic and there's the neighbour and it's devastated. This was this property um, at Bungendor outside of Canberra. So I should have gone down there. I knew about it, and I don't know why I didn't go down to hear Joel. He was in Brisbane. He was on, he was on at like 6 o'clock in the afternoon somewhere in Windsor or something. Yeah, and, I, and I, I, I don't know. I sort of weakened and I didn't go. I should have. Um, but yes, so there is a way to farm, and we don't devastate, and we do produce food. By the way, the... Maloon Creek Farms, they have free-range chickens. You go onto these amazing paddocks and he guards the chickens with those marima, marima dogs. And so the dogs live there. There's a moving hutch in the middle, big hutch, and they, the chickens go in and out whenever they feel like it. And the dogs, and when you walk into these paddocks, they've got quite a lot of uh, legumes, medics, you know, about, you know, yay high. All of a sudden, you see these little sort of red heads, sort of, and then you find out that he actually has about 10,000 chooks on each of these properties, on each of these um, cereal things. And I'd love to think how rich that soil will be after it's had chook poo on it for that amount of time, because he, he does rotate them. Another question? One, one more question, and I fear that's okay. all we have time for. And just this. Or maybe, uh, okay. Sorry? I, I, I was, okay, I'll, and I just about, haven't finished the question. You want to talk about nitrogen, okay. okay. But then that's um, we've sort of been, you know, the conversation that's going around seems to, there's often this thing of methane cropping up and how do we, how do we have a farming method that allows us to extract enough food, how do we stock enough? Um, and I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of methods of stocking at the moment which... Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's the movement of the cattle that's highly important. Yeah. And when you allow the cattle to move, uh, the grass in the soil actually sequesters and holds more carbon. Mm -hmm. So you, you crack back on that methane problem quite significantly. And when we look historically, we see that um, hooved animals uh, were a lot more abundant than they are now. And in fact, we had them everywhere. Um, but at those times, we never had a global warming problem even when we had uh, very, very large herbivores roaming all over Eurasia at, in great, like much greater densities than we do now, we ate them all. Um, so it's certainly possible to have those stocking densities and not have the atmospheric problem that we have at the moment. Thank you for that. Yes, th that is true. The um, 
The biomass of, her, of ruminant herbivores at the moment is less than it was if we went back 12, 15,000 years ago, even less than it was um, at just coming out of the last ice age. The other thing, of course, is we have to understand that there are huge um, numbers of tribal communities of, of humans that don't have. I mean, if you live in the Arctic Circle or anywhere near it, hello, you don't even have greens in winter. You live on meat. You live on your salted and your stored and your dried meats. We can't go to any Pacific Islander and say, you know, well, what was your grain? It wasn't. It was cassava. It might have been tapioca. They had starches. So what I'm trying to say is if we have to choose a food source, we should make sure we include. If, when we're running out of soil, maybe we should return the grazing animals to the lands and let them graze, not feed them grain. And we will have food and our soils will be getting back into a, ni a natural sequence. A friend. That's right. Um, to put this into context, to get to nitrogen, yeah. So if we went back 10,000 years and we go, go and we took all the mammal flesh on the planet, okay, the mammalian zoomass, yeah. and we put it in a big pile somewhere. Yeah. You know, blue whales, cats, pigs, dogs, lions, tigers, zebras, human beings, the whole lot. 10,000 years ago, if we separated out the human beings and our domesticated animals from the entire mammalian zoomass, yeah. that re represented less than 0.01% of all the mammalian zoomass. Thank you. At th but at the start of the Industrial Revolution, that went up to 10 to 12%. And I'll ask in the room here, some people know the answer, what do you think humanity and our domesticated animals currently represent as a percentage of all the mammal flesh on this planet? I'll put it around about 50%. Between 96 and 98% of all the mammal flesh on this planet yeah. is human beings or our and our domesticated animals. Yeah. We then start talking about nitrogen. Okay, in order for that incredible flourish of human and domesticated animal flesh, as part of that green revolution, we tapped into the fact that by a, a process of the Harbour-Bosch process yeah. to manufacture nitrogen fertilizers that's right, right? Um, and that is that is by using natural gas through a catalytic process with cobalt 9 okay now we have to start asking questions about peak oil peak coal peak natural gas and if we actually went back and looked at the natural nitrogen cycles capacity to build human bodies without and this is just human bodies you know looking at all the different trophic levels below that that's, that's less than four billion human beings, and that doesn't include the domesticated animals as well. So we've got some challenges. Right? So we have to put this in the context of where are we right now and how would we get back to that with the scale that we've become on the planet and the addictions that we have to the various sort of tool sets, whether it's digging up black stuff and burning it, you know, combustion engines, the internet, all these sorts of things. I mean, it's a big challenge. But we've got to face that stuff at the same time. Thank you for that. I think that's about it. The, the last statement was, I keep thinking this works, but the last statement was basically the fact that nitrogen, you know, forget peak phosphate, whatever, nitrogen's running out. My argument is the nitrogen is one of the reasons nitrogen is running out because it's got rubber plants on top of it that we put, have put there. I think that's it. Thank you. There's um, no thank, more questions. Thank you, no. Deb. No, we must bring it to an end. I'm sorry. We need to vacate the room. Thank you all very much. And would you join me in thanking Deb Newell very much indeed. <laughs>